Good morning. As Aaron said, I have one final announcement. I didn't want to entrust it to him. Uh, we, were, uh, <laughs> we, are, we are doing the, the book club on Friday. So anyone who wants to join the book club, you are welcome to do so. You can sign up online or you could just show up. If you're a really avid reader, you could read the whole book this week. It is Pilgrim's Progress. And uh, you could skip the second half if you wanted to. It's, it's, it's not super necessary. But yeah, we're, we're meeting at Hope Church. Uh, they have an actual building on Overton and Thornydale. And that's where we're going to be meeting at at 6.30. So uh, anyone who wants to come, please do so. I'm going to be sending out an email this week of, uh, not email, an essay of just kind of my overall takeaways from the book. So if you want to receive that, like I said, just sign up outside. Um, but that being said, we're going to be entering into a bit of dicey territory today. So let's pray before we enter into it and uh, uh, see if God could lead us into unity and hopefully greater clarity. So Father, we love you and we're grateful for you. And uh, I do pray for this teaching that as we navigate your word, you would help us to see within it uh, important tenets, important points and topics that we could learn from in our current day and age that is becoming increasingly divisive and increasingly corrupt. Uh, we pray that we would be able to have hope and clarity within you, Lord, in your name. Amen. So the passage I want to begin with, uh, we have been going through the book of Genesis, but I'm taking a break today because every now and then something happens news-wise that makes me feel as though I... As a shepherd, it makes me feel like I should talk about it. So uh, we're going to begin with this passage. Ephesians 4, verse 3 says this, Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. One of the main things that I have as a job, as a pastor, is to maintain the bond of unity within the church to the greatest of my ability. And part of doing that is not making issue of things that would unnecessarily divide the body of Christ. I am supposed to utilize the word, I'm supposed to handle it with care, and I'm supposed to speak in a way that honors God's scripture so that we can maintain unity in our common faith towards God, right? We have a common father, we have a common baptism, we have a common unity together as a church, and that's a beautiful and wonderful thing. But what happens when things occur within our world that seek to divide us down alternative lines that aren't necessarily scriptural? How do we maintain unity within the body, and what does that unity look like? So I believe that right now we are in an increasingly politicized time. We're in an increasingly fractious time as a nation. And that threatens to sever the unity that, ha that we enjoy as a body down political lines. The other danger that we can go into, and we're going to talk more about it, is that I genuinely believe that the church has a role within our given society that we are not actually supposed to remain silent when we see injustices prevailing within our world. That we are supposed to be, as Jesus puts it, salt and light. We are supposed to express to the world both the law of God as well as the goodness of God. And that doesn't just stay in a heavenly place. There are physical implications. And I, I try to express that from the pulpit as often as I can, that we live in the freedom and the liberty and the joy that we have as a country, we live there because our forebears, our ancestors in the faith, fought hard to develop the system of government that we enjoy, to give us the liberties that we enjoy, to make sure that things like slavery were abolished, to make sure that things like the Colosseum were taken away, to make sure that segregation was removed. Those were Christians who decided to take the gospel of Jesus Christ seriously and take its implication seriously to the society that they dwell in. And so we don't want to be a complacent church that participates with injustice within our society, but we also don't want to become a church that becomes overly politicized and separates and divides over things that we ought not to. We do not want to make an idol of politics. So how do we do that? And that's something that I've been wrestling with a lot since we planted the church, trying to figure out, because I take that 
very seriously as a pastor. And I, I've definitely leaned one way before, and I'm now trying to find the balance. For the majority of my time as a pastor, I genuinely believe that the church had nothing to say about the political situation and that we should never speak out. I have since come to the conclusion that that was a wrong way of thinking. And I'm going to try to, to help you guys understand why I've come to that conclusion. And to also, again, try to find what is that common ground that we can stand upon as a church and disagree passionately without dividing in our relationships or our faith. And I, I sometimes say this jokingly, if we can't disagree lovingly within the body, how do you think you're going to disagree with people outside the body? To put it another way, if I, if I can't stand before someone who is a fellow Christian and say to them, hey, I, I genuinely think you're wrong about this. I think that it's, it's bad for our country or it's bad for our society to follow these particular belief systems. If I can't do that within the body, how much more difficult is it to stand up to a friend and say, hey, I genuinely think that God's wrath is upon you and that you're separated from him. And if you don't repent, you're not going to spend eternity with God but apart from him. How am I going to have the courage to do that if I can't even come alongside a brother in the faith and tell them that I think that they're off on something like a societal or political issue? So once again, we do have great liberty within our common faith. I don't believe that our faith limits us to a particular political party. But once again, it's not infinitely I mean, it's not infinitely unlimited. There are limits within what we can believe. And even if it doesn't separate you from Christ to believe a particular thing, it might be sinful to believe a particular thing. So once again, there were many Christians who either openly supported segregation in our country or were completely silent about it. Now, we would look back at them and say, you were wrong. You were wrong to do that. I think that those people are going to heaven, depending on how they actually believed in their theological convictions. But I believe that they were wrong in not speaking out about that evil and injustice that was happening in our society. So what is an injustice that I believe is happening right now that we need to be aware of? Well, if you're living under a rock, you haven't heard about this, but uh, Donald Trump is under four different indictments across the country, and he was just last Thursday found guilty on 34 felony counts at the civil court, I mean, I'm sorry, at the, uh, the criminal court in New York City, Manhattan. And whatever you feel about Donald Trump as a person, whether you hate him or whether you love him, a threat to our justice system, meaning if people begin to believe or doubt greatly the justice of our system of law, that has very big implications for the country as a whole. So even if you hate Donald Trump, you have to admit that prosecuting him in such a way where half, if not more than half of the country feels as though our system of justice is becoming corrupted may not be the best move. And it may cause problems that affect all of us. If we do not trust in our system of law and if we do not trust in our system of election, what does that say for our system of government that is led by the people and for the people? In order to explore these issues a little bit more deeply, I'm going to focus on my favorite book in the Bible, which is the book of Jeremiah. I'm going to give you guys a bit of a book recommendation. If you haven't read the book of Jeremiah, read the book of Jeremiah. It might be the most important book that you have within your Bibles for these fractious and divisive times that we are living in. And I love the book of Jeremiah. I read it for the first time when I was a teenager, and I absolutely hated it. I thought it was a terrible book. I didn't get anything out of it. I read it again after I got back from my first deployment to Afghanistan. So I went on deployment to Afghanistan in 2010, and I was a young, optimistic, patriotic young man. And I believed fervently in what I was doing. I love this country so much that I was willing to fight for it and potentially die for it. And I still do but when I went over to Afghanistan, I saw that there was a lack of conviction at the top and bottom about what we were doing. And I knew that because of that lack of conviction and that political corruption that existed at various levels within our political structure, as well as even in our society, I knew that the sacrifices that me and my friends made that year were ultimately going to be in vain. 
So when Afghanistan fell in 2021, I was as grieved as anybody else, but I was also not surprised because I knew that that was going to happen. And so when I came home, I was really, really angry. And I didn't know what to do with my anger. I didn't know how to process it. And the book of Jeremiah helped me do it. So what's the book of Jeremiah about? Well, it's about a young, optimistic guy who's called by God to speak and call out the corruption that was permeating his nation. And he begins to do it, and you see his trajectory. This is one of the things I love about the book of Jeremiah, is he is just a real guy. Man, and he begins so optimistic, and he's like a little firecracker. He's like, dude, I'm going to change the nation. And then immediately his family tries to kill him, and he's like, oh, never mind. Maybe it's not going to work out the way I thought. And he's like, no, 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 I'm going to go to the capital, and I'm going to talk to the king. And the priests and the people who are in the political edifices of our nation, they're going to hear me for sure. And they don't. And they lock him in prison. They throw him in and they start persecuting him. And through his persecution, he starts realizing the situation in my country was worse than I thought. The corruption in my nation was worse than I ever imagined. And you see him go from like really optimistic to super cynical of, I don't want to talk to these people anymore. I'm done. God, you judge them, right? And then God gets a hold of him. He's like, okay, never mind. I care again. And he, he goes back and forth, though, because like I said, he's just a very human figure in the Bible. He, you could relate to him at such a beautiful level. And he writes out his prayers to God while he's going through these tumultuous times. And what it really taught me is it taught me, how do I talk to God when I'm mad? How do I talk to God when I'm grieved? How do I communicate with the Lord of heaven and believe that he hears me and understands me and is going to minister to me where I'm at? So once again, there's a lot of people this week who are really upset about what's going on in our country. There are some people who are apathetic, and we'll talk more about that in a second. But regardless of where you're at emotionally, may I encourage you, seek God passionately in your emotions. He sees what's happening, he's aware of it, and he actually cares. And maybe you read some of the responses that God gives to Jeremiah, because they're kind of, they're cool, right? Some of them are like, you're doing great, man, I got you. And some of them are like, you're doing terrible, stop it. And some of them are like, you need to buck up, buddy, because it's going to get a lot worse, right? So there are some really interesting responses that God gives to Jeremiah, and they're all quite amazing. So this is from one of Jeremiah's first sermons. A young little prophet Jeremiah, he comes up and he gives his, one of his first prophetic messages. And it's in Jeremiah chapter 7. And we're starting verse 5. And he says this, For if you thoroughly amend your ways and your doings, if you thoroughly execute judgment between a man and his neighbor, if you do not oppress the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place, or walk after other gods to your hurt. Then I will cause you to dwell in this land and in this place that I have given to your fathers forever and ever. One of the more shocking things about this prophetic message is it has nothing to do. There's that one little section that talks about idolatry, but the rest of it is all societal things. He's talking about the justice system. It's a shocking thing for us to maybe read that today as the church and to realize that you can have a prophet, someone that God has literally called out to be his messenger, his ambassador to the world, and he gives a political sermon about the injustices that are happening within the land. And his fear, his worry is that if they do not adjust the injustices, if he says, if the law is not ameliorated, so that you do not have a two-tiered justice system in which one party or one group of people is being benefited and the other is being oppressed by it. If we don't do this, his worry is we will cease to be a nation. That's what God tells him. You will cease to be a nation if you don't fix this. Why? Well, there's a literal reason that God is going to actually judge them. But there's also a reason that gets to the societal importance of justice. Now, we live in a world that's very fascinating. How many of you know your neighbors? Like, actually know them on a first-name basis. You know who they are? You know where they come from? A couple old people? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Young people are like, no way. I don't, I don't even know people I work with. Uh, you know, so, you know, most of us don't know our neighbors. 
But even if you know your neighbors, every day you're driving with people that are total strangers. You're going to work with people who are strangers. You are sending your kids to schools with strangers. And why is it that we're able to dwell in relative safety with one another? Well, it's because that we believe in this system of law that adjudicates between us. We know that if my neighbor steps out of line, I don't have to avenge myself. There is a legal system that is going to avenge that person for me. I know that there are law enforcement apparatchiks within our society that keep us safe. And we believe in these systems, we believe in these institutions to keep us safe, to do what is right, to exercise the law correctly. Well, what happens when you don't believe in those systems anymore? This is Psalm, 100, this is Psalm 11, verse 2. It says this, For look, the wicked bend their bow. They make ready their arrow on the string, that they may shoot secretly at the, at the upright in heart. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? What's he saying? There are evil people in this world that want to take advantage of the innocent. If the foundations, what foundations? The foundations of law are removed, what can the righteous do? Jesus in his sermon on the, on the, Olivet, uh, the Mount Olive before he goes to his crucifixion, he says this, in the end times, lawlessness will abound and the love of many will grow cold. It's our system of law that allows for us to exist as a society. If you doubt the system of law, if you start to believe that the system of law is not for you, or it no longer is there to uphold justice, it dissolves the society that you live in. It removes the foundations by which you and I are able to live together in harmony. And that is a bad thing. Cultures don't last long when their system of law is questioned. And there's a reason why. Now, after the political indictment of Donald Trump, I want you to listen to how our enemies are perceiving this moment. This is from the Global Times. This is the Chinese propagandistic media outlet. And this is what they said about Donald Trump's prosecution. The Democrats have condemned Trump in the name of democracy, yet their own practices are also undemocratic. The attitudes of both parties further reflects the rottenness of American politics and that the law now seems to be used as a political weapon. When a dictatorship says that about your system of law, it's not a good sign. This is something that, and you notice what they're saying, the Democrats are doing it now, but notice what they're saying. The other side does it too. So they're happy, they're like, this is awesome. This means that their system is unstable, and that means they're vulnerable. When your enemies are celebrating about something that's happening in your country, you may wanna look at what's happening in your country. So, there's, a, there's an interesting play, it was written by a guy named Aeschylus. It was one of the first like trilogies that ever came out. It came out in like the 400s BC, so some of you guys have probably heard of it, obviously. Um, it's called The Arrestia. Right? And in this book, it's kind of like the sequel to the Iliad, if you care about Greek plays, right? It's like the sequel to the Iliad, and it's a trilogy. So, you know, Hollywood's not new at doing this, by the way. They have, like, their little cinematic universes as well. And basically what happens is after the king comes back from the Trojan Wars, the wife gets mad at him because he sacrifices their daughter. I'm not going to get into that. And she kills him. And then her son kills her. And there's all this vengeance that is going on, and it's unchecked, and the society's starting to crumble and break apart. And then all of a sudden, Athena comes down, and adjudicates over the trial of Arestia. That's his name. And basically, what Athena says at the end is she says, unless there is a system of civil law, then your society will be nothing but an unending practice of vengeance. Okay? That is the worry that I have for where we're at right now. That if the society starts to lose faith in the justice system, all there will be left is a never-ending 
cycle of actions of violence and vengeance. And that's exactly what's happening on the right right now. The right is saying, this is so unjust, this is so evil, we need to persecute our political enemies now. We need to show them what it's like. And the left is saying, well, if you do that, then we're going to go after your guys. And there's this interesting dynamic that's developing. We're, it's like a slow motion car crash that we're viewing right now. And it's not good. And so, yes, we as Christians ought to care about this. We ought to care about the foundations of justice that we live in peace because of. If you think that lawlessness is bad right now, read any history book about what criminal gangs were like in places that don't have solid justice systems. Or better yet, look up Haiti and see how they're doing. When there's no system of law, when the government is not trusted, it doesn't make things better. It makes things actually a lot worse. I'm going to quote from Martin Luther King now. So Martin Luther King, he went to prison in Birmingham, Alabama. So he, he's from Georgia, right? And he goes to Birmingham, Alabama to protest the segregation laws there. And he's arrested. While he's in prison, numerous pastors condemn him. And they say, this guy is political. He's not a reverend. He's crossing state lines to protest issues that have nothing to do with him. And therefore, we actually think that what he's doing is wrong. And he wrote a letter. It's called The Letter from Birmingham Jail. It's an excellent, excellent letter. It's not very long. It won't take you long to get through, but it's very, very good. And he is writing as Reverend Martin Luther King, right? He is he's writing as a pastor in that letter. And this is what he says. There's one excerpt from it. Moreover, I am cognizant of the interrelatedness of all communities and states. I cannot sit idly by in Atlanta and not be concerned about what happens in Birmingham. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. So it might be easy, especially if you hate Donald Trump, it might be easy to look at what's going on right now and say, well, who cares? That dude's a scumbag and he should be in prison for any number of things. So I don't really care if they got him for this unrelated thing in New York City. You should care because injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. If the legal system can target a man and not a crime, that's not a good thing. When you have a DA named Alvin Bragg stand up and say, I'm going to get Donald Trump, and that's what he runs on, and then, lo and behold, he gets Donald Trump, that's not a good thing. A threat to justice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We should be concerned about this. 1 Corinthians 5 or 6, which is what... Martin Luther King is riffing off of in that section, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. And this goes both ways. If the right starts retaliating and affecting justice, then we must speak out against that as well. And if the left speaks out and does things, we have to speak out about that. That's what the church is supposed to do. We're supposed to be salt and light. We're supposed to condemn injustice when we see it. Because we recognize something as the church that we are supposed to uphold the justice of God. And there are many things happening right now in our country. Even the border crisis is a good example. Should we care about it? Now, you can make arguments either way. I'm, I'm open to hearing arguments from the left, from people on the political left, saying we should amend our border policy. We should let way more people in. I'm totally open to that. What I'm not open to is an absolute flagrant violation of the law. If you want to change the law, I'm open to that. I am not open to disregarding the law. Because a threat to justice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Now, what should or ought we to do about this? So if we should feel a little bit upset about this, what should we do about it? Should we all vote for Trump? No. Uh, if, you know, I'm not going to tell you not to do that either. But that's not really what we're supposed to do as a church, right? I'm not supposed to, again, come up here and tell you what you should do politically but I can tell you what to do morally. 
one of the main things that the church has to stand firm against is, like I said, we have to stand firm against injustice, but we also have to agree together to not participate with lies. Now, again, I could sit down with a Christian from the opposite side of the political spectrum, and we can talk about this, and we can come to very different conclusions in our conversation. That's fine. The blood of Christ covers that. What we cannot do is use lies to get to our conclusion. We cannot support untruths in order to support our political priors. That shows if I'm willing to use lies to get to the political conclusion that I want, it shows that I've made an idol of my politics. We serve the God of all truth. In 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 10 through 12, it says, And with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they may be saved, and for this reason, God will send them a strong delusion that they should believe the lie, and they will be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. There are many lies going on right now from both political aisles. I'm not pointing out one over the other. I am saying that the greater threat is coming from the left, but I'm not saying that the right is innocent, and I'm not saying that there aren't lies being propagated from the right. We cannot, as a church, we cannot participate with lies. First, because God has called us to be in truth, but second, because every tyrannical regime is begun and created by a willingness of the population to participate in lies. That's how it happens. Alexander Solzhenitsyn, he was a thinker, Christian, theologian in the Soviet Russia era, wrote extensively about it. And he probably understood this point more than anyone else that I've ever read. And I'm going to quote a little bit from an essay he wrote called Live Not By Lies. But before I do, I want to quote a different thing from him, where he says about Soviet Russia, he says this, that any system, and I'm paraphrasing here, obviously, any system that rises to unjust power must do so on the back of lies. Why? Because in the conscience of man, we have to believe that what we're doing is correct not merely effective. So what he means by that is we have consciences given to us by God. We can't get rid of them, but we can manipulate them. So the Nazis, there's no way the Nazis are going to be able to exterminate the Jews by telling the people, hey, we're a really, really evil, tyrannical governmental system, and we want to exterminate a group of people who are completely innocent, and we want your support. They're not going to say that. They're going to convince the people through lies that the Jews are worthy of extermination. That only happens when the people in the country are willing to go along with it. And as the Soviet Union started to become more and more corrupt, Alexander Solzhenitsyn was worried about it, and he realized people are going along with convenient lies to keep the peace. And he realized that it's on the back of that willingness that Stalin becomes Stalin, that Hitler becomes Hitler, that Mao Zedong becomes Mao Zedong. And in his essay, he says this, and therein we find neglected by us the simplest and most accessible key to our liberation, a personal non-participation in lies. Even if all is covered by lies, even if all is under their rule, let us resist in the smallest way. Let their rule hold not through me. And this is the way to break out of the imaginary encirclement of our inertness. The easiest way for us and the most devastating for the lies. And for the, for when the people renounce lies, lies simply cease to exist. Like parasites, they can only survive when attached to a person. We are not called upon to step out into the square and shout out the truth, to say it out loud what we think. This is scary. We're not ready. But let us at least refuse to say what we do not think. Now, lest you believe that this is a little bit utopian thinking, Alexander Solzhenitsyn received the Nobel Peace Prize because many attribute the majority of the collapse of the Soviet Union to him. Well, what did he do that was so impressive that caused the Soviet Union to collapse? He released a book called The Gulag Archipelago. And all it did 
is it recounted the real stories of people who were unfairly and unjustly targeted by the Soviet government. He refused to lie for the government and pretend like many of the people did that, oh, this person just disappeared. I don't know what happened to them. They must have moved away, right? During the peak of the Soviet Union, this is crazy. I'm watching a documentary right now on the Soviet Union. I didn't, I didn't know any of this. It's, it's really crazy. The police, the secret police would come and round people up at around 2 a.m. Everyone in the country, there's like documents and people talking about everyone in the country just being wide awake at 2 in the morning, listening for whether the police would come to their door. Because they all knew when it happened, they all knew why it was happening, but they weren't willing to say anything about it. They were too scared to admit, hey, my neighbor got arrested unjustly. Because if you say that, guess what? They're going to come to your door at 2 in the morning. Alexander Solzhenitsyn said, I don't care what it costs me. I don't care if I go to prison. I don't care if I die there. I will not participate with lies. Right now, the cost of doing that is very low. And if we're not willing to stand for truth now, it might get a lot harder coming up. Martin E. Muller is a guy who learned this the hard way. So Martin E. Muller was a, was a pastor in Germany when the Nazis were rising to power. And he didn't say anything. He started to support the Nazis. And he found out too late that they weren't what they said they were. And he started to go against them. When he finally went against them, he was locked in jail. And from prison, he says this very infamous, infamous phrase. First, they came for the socialists. And I didn't speak out. Because I wasn't a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, unionists. And I didn't speak out. Because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I didn't speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. It might be convenient. Again, like I said, you might like the fact that Trump is in prison. That's fine. I would disagree with you, but that's fine. You cannot support it based on lies, though. If he's done something wrong, then he should go to jail for doing something wrong. You cannot support a conviction that is based on lies. That's something that we can't do as Christians, that we should not do. Now I've said, I am willing to be convinced otherwise. Right now, I believe that this conviction was based on lies. I am willing to be convinced out of that conviction. I've yet to hear one. I've read numerous political reports from both sides. And I've yet to hear a good argument that what happened to Trump was not politically motivated, that it was unbiased, and that it actually was an upholding of the law. And this is where you should get the most worried. I encourage you today, read articles about this from CNN, MSNBC, and then read an article about it from Fox News. See how the legal experts are handling it. And this should make us very worried. The right now believes, how do we know that Trump is innocent? Because he's being targeted by the authorities. The left thinks, how do we know that Trump is guilty? because he was found guilty. I read a long article last night by a, a, a political and legal analyst from MSNBC. And in the article, they basically say, yeah, they didn't really prove the burden. Of, they didn't actually meet the burden of proof in the court system, but the jury found him guilty, so he's guilty. That was literally the conclusion of this legal analyst. If the society, once again, if you see the right is basically saying, because the legal system is doing it, we don't believe it that shows that the foundations are being removed, right? And if the political left is saying, we should believe it because the institution says it's right, that means that there's an idolatry of the system. Both are bad. Both are very, very bad, you know? So the other thing that we should really fear is the collapse of the system itself. So again, many people on the right are, are basically, they've been demoralized about the system that we have. And they just think the whole thing is shot through with corruption. We can't salvage it. We should just let it burn. Well, Jeremiah witnesses this happen. He witnesses his system of government burn down because it was too corrupt to be saved. And maybe we're there. But maybe read the book of Lamentations before you get too giddy about that. <laughs> Lamentations chapter 1, verse 1 says this, How lonely sits the city that was full of people. 
How like a widow is she, who was great among the nations. The princess among the provinces has become a slave. She weeps bitterly in the night. Her tears are on her cheeks. Among all her lovers, she, is, uh, she has none to comfort her. All her friends have dealt treacherously with her. They have become her enemies. And he goes on from there. It gets, more, it gets worse, by the way. Keep reading it, and it gets, it gets a lot more bummed out. If you think that someone could rise to power and normalize the fractious situation that we're in through top-down authority, if you believe that will happen bloodlessly, that is a very naive way of thinking. It won't. It can't. We should not long for that. We should not want that. We should try with all of our power to avoid that eventuality. Because once that cycle of vengeance begins, it's very hard to stop. Now, this is another interesting thing. Rene Girard, who's a philosopher, he had an interesting thought that Christianity actually brought the uh, Roman Empire down. He believes that, the, that Christianity brought the Roman Empire down. Now, many Enlightenment thinkers thought the same thing. But he had a different take on it. He had a very different take on it. He believes that Christianity destroyed the Roman Empire because Christianity and the resurrection specifically proves that the Roman system of government was so corrupt that they would even crucify the Son of God. In other words, as people started to convert to Christianity, people from Rome, they were like, oh my gosh, we killed God? Man, our system must be a little bit corrupt. Like It must be a little on the corrupt side if we tried the Son of God in our court system and found him guilty. All right, think about that for a second. What if you found that out? Like our system of government actually tried the Son of God, put him on trial in our system of government, and found him guilty and executed him as a political dissident. The resurrection is not a good signal to your system of governance at that point. Rome could not remain standing once people realized that the system had become that bad. Once again, if our system is proved to be that bad, it cannot remain standing. There is a way, I, I could see a way back from where we're at right now, but it's not an easy one. And would it, it would again require the church to stand strong against the lies and injustices that are happening from both sides. And we must be careful not to be motivated by wrath. Martin Luther King was very worried about failing to stop segregation in the South. He was more worried that his movement would be taken over by the revolutionary side of his movement. He was much more worried about that. He gave many sermons warning that people were not moved by vengeance, but by the grace of God. Wrath is a very, very real thing that we have to actually keep in our mind. Now it's not condemned, Psalm 4 verse 4, be angry and do not sin, meditate within your heart on your bed and be still. Anger is not condemned by God. In fact, there are things that we ought to be angry about. In fact, you could actually read this Psalm as a commandment to be angry, but not to sin. How do you sin with anger? James 1 verse 20, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Anger is a normal emotion. It is our passionate, instinctive emotion or reaction to injustice. That's where your anger comes from. And it's good. God gets angry because he's the most just being in the universe. He gets more angry than you and I ever will, actually. But when you're moved by your anger to act, you are being moved <laughs> as a judge. Right? That's, how God, that's why God is able to act out of anger and not sin, but you and I can't. Jesus says, judge not, lest you be judged. You and I are not the judges of the world. We don't see the whole picture. When we're moved by wrath, we are usurping the role of God in the universe, and we're guaranteeing that we will move in unjust ways. Be angry, but what does he say? Meditate within your heart on your bed and be still. Go to God with your anger. Talk to him about it. And to the level that you can trust that your God is a, is a God who sees and judges unrighteousness is the level of peace that you will have in your personal life. I love this line from 
Stuart Townsend. He wrote an excellent, kind of like a modern day hymn called In Christ Alone. It says, In Christ alone who took on flesh, fullness of God and helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save. Till on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was laid. Here in the death of Christ, I live. The only blood that could be shed in this universe that is holy enough and infinite enough to actually cover righteous wrath is the blood of Christ. And the person who believes that, the person who actually accepts that Jesus bled and died for the unrighteousness of the world, that he absorbed the wrath of God, only that person can be moved passionately towards justice without giving in to wrath. Only that person will not be consumed by vengeance. Only that person will be able to even forgive and love their enemies. Any other motivation will lead you into the same cycle of violence that permeates the world. The wrath of God was satisfied in the blood of Christ. And Jesus will come back to judge the living and the dead. That's where justice is going to reign. We need to set our expectations at a reasonable level. Anyone who believes that they could achieve perfect justice this side of heaven is one who is fooling themselves. And they will probably create far more injustices in their quest for utopia than they imagine. You realize that, again, the Soviet Union, Nazi-occupied Germany, you know they weren't trying to screw up the world? It's hard for us to remember that. But that wasn't what they were trying to do. They were trying to fix the world. But as the old saying goes, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Now, I'm going to wrap up this teaching with one final quote from Martin Luther King, because I want you to see why this animated him, why he believed that this was so important. And it's throughout his writing, it's, it's throughout his speeches, but most people don't talk about it. His most famous speech is the I Have a Dream speech. Now listen to how he ends the speech. I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted, every hill and mountain shall be made low. The rough places will be made plain, and the crooked places will be made straight, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. This is our hope. This is the faith that I go back to the south with. With this faith, we will be able to hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope. With this faith, we will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. With this faith, we will be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, to stand up for freedom together, knowing that we will be free one day. The path to true justice is a path that is built on faith, hope, and love. Faith in the promises of God, hope in the justice of God, and therefore a love that is reflective of God's agape love for our fellow man. Let's pray. Father, we love you and we're grateful for you. I do pray for us as a church that we could recognize soberly the dangers that are afflicting our society. And we would be those who fight for justice. We would be those who stand for truth and not compromise. But we would also be those who have such utter confidence in your sovereignty, your will, and your eventual return that we would not be consumed with despair, anxiety, and wrath like our fellow man. That when people see us fighting for your will, they would not see people animated by vengeance or discouragement, but they would see people who are proclaiming the hope of the future glory of your coming. Lord, help us to do this well. Help us to do this righteously. And in your name, amen. So let's take communion. That is a part of what we're doing in communion. We are proclaiming the return of Christ before it happens. We are taking of his body. We're taking of his blood. We're remembering what he 